Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Alcerod, Mr. Rove, members of Congress, Ms. Compton, distinguished guests, good evening. And for those watching via live stream in Hawaii, aloha. <laughs> On behalf of the Library of Congress, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening as we celebrate a wonderful five-year collaboration with the Daniel K. Inouye Institute to commemorate the life, legacy, and values of the late Senator Daniel Inouye. Now these events have been annual highlights for the library and they've featured distinguished friends of the late Senator, current and former cabinet members, and other prominent thought leaders. For five decades, the Inouye Lecture has brought an expansive range of themes and a diverse group of scholars, journalists, politicians, diplomats, and historians. From the first lecture with Secretaries of State, Madeleine Albright and Colin Powell, to tonight's distinguished guests, these lectures have left an enduring legacy at the library. And some of you may know that this year, our theme at the library is celebrating our nation's change makers. And I think you'll all agree that our guests tonight fill that bill. And we are excited to hear them talk about the challenges of our nation's political system. The lectures have been made possible by a very generous donation from the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. And we are sorry that Mrs. Inouye, the Senator's widow, and the driving force behind his legacy could not be here with us this evening. But I ask you to join me in recognizing her because she is watching. Thank you. And so now, Ms. Jennifer Sabas, director of the Inouye Institute, will say a few words. On behalf of the Daniel K. Inouye Institute and the Inouye family, Aloha and good evening. You know, it's hard to believe that this is our fifth and final lecture this evening. The underlying theme that we selected to serve and to honor the Senator's legacy in his more than 50 years of elected service is bipartisanship, the power of bipartisanship. And as a, as a librarian said, you know, we began in 2015 with former secretaries of state, Madeleine Albright and Colin Powell. And we have continued each year with amazing Democrats and Republicans on this stage. One of the Senator's favorite sayings was that we can disagree without being disagreeable, which sums up his longtime friendship and relationship with Bob Dole, Ted Stevens, Warren Rudman, among others. And while bipartisanship may be on the endangered list right now, I know that he would never give up hope that it will one day return to Capitol Hill as an important means to move our nation's agenda forward. A special thanks to our librarian, Carla Haywood, and his her predecessor, James Billington. To Ann Compton, who has moderated all of the five series and has brought out the best in each of the speakers. A special shout out to our institute partner, the University of Hawaii with some of our senior leaderships in the house this evening and with the lecture being live streamed on our Manoa campus for our students to enjoy. And finally, in his later years, the Senator was very fond of saying that America is a great country and that nowhere else but in this country could the grandson of Japanese immigrants who came to Hawaii in search of a better life who would be deemed an enemy alien during World War II solely because of the color of his skin, and who would go on to become the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest accolade our nation can bestow for military valor, and then would go on still further to become the President Pro Tem of the United States Senate, and third in succession to the presidency. Only in America, he would say, if you're prepared to dream big, work hard, and never give up. 
So thank you to all of you for your support and friendship and allowing us to share this series with you. It is now my pleasure to bring to the stage John Haskell, the director of the Kluge Center. Thank you, Jen and Dr. Hayden. Before we uh, begin, let me take a moment to remind you to silence your cell phones. Uh, and for those of you who are tweeting this event, we are using the hashtags, hashtag Inouye and hashtag Kluge. Let me say a few things about Senator Inouye, a few things that, that Jen didn't already mention. He was an Olympian figure in Washington, as most of you know, as well as in his home state of Hawaii. Born in Honolulu in 1924, he graduated from high school less than six months after Pearl Harbor. After the ban was lifted on Japanese Americans serving their country, he enlisted in the Army and served in the famous 442nd Regiment, a unit of Japanese American soldiers who fought with extraordinary gallantry in Italy, France, and Germany. In the final weeks in Europe, in 1945, he was severely wounded in battle after taking out two German machine gun nests. He lost his right arm. He returned home with a Distinguished Service Cross, Bronze Star Medal, two Purple Hearts, and 12 other medals and citations. His commitment to bipartisanship stemmed in part from his lifelong friendship with Bob Dole, whom he met in the hospital after the war. After coming home, he was graduated from the University of Hawaii and became Hawaii's first representative in 1959, three years later elected to the Senate in the same class as Senator Edward Kennedy, of course, at that time, the president's brother. He served for 50 years in the Senate, a rich legacy that included the National Museum of the Native American and prominent service on the Senate Watergate Committee, the Iran-Contra Committee, and decades of service on the Appropriations Committee, which he chaired. He was awarded, as Jen pointed out, the Congressional Medal of Honor in 2000 for his military service, but he was also awarded posthumously the Presidential Medal of Freeman, Freedom, becoming the first senator to receive both of those honors. Tonight, the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress and the Daniel K. Inouye Institute present the fifth and final in this five-year distinguished lecture series to, to commemorate Senator Inouye's commitment to bipartisanship, moral courage, public service, and civic enhancement. enhancement. I now would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Please welcome David Axelrod, former Chief Strategist and Senior Advisor to President Barack Obama, Carl Rove, Senior Advisor and Deputy Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush, and former ABC White House correspondent, Ann Compton. Thank you for coming tonight. The issues, the big issues embraced by the Inouye Foundation have never been more important. Shared values, protecting civil liberties, encouraging service, idealism, restoring the American dream. And tonight, leadership in an age of political conflict, you think? <laughs> the fabric of democracy has never been uh, under so much stress. Leadership is always a challenge, and reporters like me always cover politics as a fight on a battlefield. So the good news is, tonight we have two real experts, both of them adversaries, but sharing the stage tonight and bringing together their ideas on their vision of American leadership, which because they have obviously uh, seen it up close. We are seeing a graphic example of political conflict at this very moment. Uh, Karl Rove is what we're seeing in the last 72 hours between the White House and the Congress. Has some barrier been broken this weekend that we had not seen before? Well, I, I don't, in one way, no, because we've always had sort of ugliness pop up periodically through American politics. Um, and the ugliness we're seeing in Washington has been repeated before, but I do think the last 20 years have seen a change in the nature of our political discourse. 
accompanied by changes in how we receive information and circulate information, namely the explosion of social media, the internet, and cable TV. And so I do think, I worry about this long term because we are making it easy for people to make outlandish charges or say extraordinary things and we, re, and we pay them for it by giving them lots of coverage and we particularly like it if we can engage in an extended food fight. And um, I, I, I don't think it's good for our country. I think it sickens a lot of people when they see the discourse in Washington. They say, is this the best our country can do? Is this what, and, and you know, it's not one person, it's not one party, it's, I'm worried that the system is breaking. And I used to be a much more of an optimist than I've become in the last four or five or six years. David, uh, there is a young man who uh, uh, kind of helped launch the progressive, the young progressives who've been elected to Congress. And I hope I'm saying this right, Saikat Bakar Bharti. And he has this criticism of Democrats. He says, up until now, uh, we thought that you thought we had to take back the hypothetical middle class. And he said, oh, what I think that means is you don't take unnecessary risks and you don't really do anything. Whereas he says, we've got a completely different change, which is you do the biggest, most badass thing. Can I say that? <laughs> Thank you. You just did. He says, we got a completely different theory of change. You do the biggest, most badass thing you can possibly, and then that's when you're going to excite people and when they're going to go vote. David, does he have a point? First of all, I think he said that primarily to get Ann Compton to repeat it in front of, a, <laughs> in front of an audience. Um, and just, just before I get to it, let me say, great to be with both of you. We, we are on different sides of the political, uh, the political tussle, but we, I think, share uh, a reverence for inst institutions and norms, and that's why this is concerning to all of us. Uh, and also here, to, uh, great to be here for Senator Inouye, who is a great American hero. Um, I think that uh, what, what he said is uh, a reflection of an attitude that a lot of young uh, people have, particularly young people on the progressive side, uh, who've been frustrated. Many of them grew up uh, and came to political uh, awareness uh, during the last decade, saw a uh, kind of blockade uh, uh, aimed at, uh, at President Obama, uh, and uh, things like what we saw um, at the end of the last term relative to the appointment to the Supreme Court. And, they, and their conclusion is that you have to fight fire with fire, that we can't play by Marcus of Queensberry rules if they are not. But uh, you know, there's a danger that we're in this kind of spiral uh, and that one thing feeds on another. Um, I, I took a group of students from the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago where I'm the director uh, this morning to meet with uh, Speaker Pelosi and uh, we talked about why compromise is necessary in a democracy. And um, if we have a kind of uh, scorched earth, uh, you know, zero sum game politics that envelops everything, we're not gonna accomplish anything and frustrations are going to, uh, to grow. And I'll make a last point on this. Um, I, uh, the Affordable Care Act meant a lot to me. I have a child with a chronic illness. I, I wept the night it was passed. I knew it wasn't perfect, but it, I felt it would help people, including people like myself, a child with a chronic illness. We almost went bankrupt. Um, and, but subsequent to that, and during that debate, and, and even after, I'd run into people, progressive progressives, who would say, you know, that was a dereliction because there was no public option. You should never have accepted that. And then I run into people who say, that, that law saved my life, that law saved my child, people coming up to me in tears. And I think to myself, how would I have felt if I had said to them, you know, we, we could have helped you, we could have helped your child, but we didn't because we couldn't get everything we wanted. That would have been a terrible, I think a terrible mistake.
Well, every president who faces leadership faces challenges and, and questions like that. And historians will point out to you, you know, the revolution uh, and the founding of the republic was no picnic either. There was a lot of rough talk then. But has, has democracy, David, come to a kind of a crucible moment where there could be lasting damage from what we're seeing uh, in this early part of the 21st century? No, I'm, I'm worried about it. I, I wrote a book called Believer. Uh, and so I feel like I got to stick to my brand here. Um, and it really was about a belief in this great self-correcting system of democracy that we have. And I think Carl and I have had a lot of talks about this. And you know, the, the danger is with all of this, these new developments, the, the breakdown of parties, the influence of money, the, the, uh, uh, the, the media environment, uh, social media environment, uh, and misplaced incentives because of how we sort ourselves in redistricting and so on. Um, ha has the game changed in such a way that we, will, we could actually lose, lose it? And I've been reminded a lot lately of the fact that democracy was an experiment. Democracy is a fragile uh, thing and it requires our engagement. We took too much for granted. I think I took too much for granted. I, I think we, we can lose it. And there are a lot of things that we should be concerned about right now. And so uh, this is a timely discussion. Carl, go we could probably yeah. settle it right here. Yeah, exactly, right here, right here, right now. Uh, two quick points. One, one is um, it, it, Affordable Care Act. Why was it unpopular when they were passing it, and why is it popular today? I got a cockamamie theory about it, which is it scared people when they were talking about it, and yet its implementation affects Roughly 10 million people are covered by the exchanges, another 10 million by the Medicaid expansion. But the 10 million who got insurance coverage and 170, 180 million people kept their, you know, kept their coverage. Maybe 10 million lost or 8 million lost their coverage. But it affected not the whole thing. So it was like this, David's point about incrementalism. Maybe the system is designed to accept incrementalism and to be afraid of massive, huge changes unless they seem justified by the circumstances of a national emergency. We must abolish slavery. We must mobilize to win World War II. Um, but if it, is, if it is a big change in a time of peace, particularly as it affects us, second thing is this, this issue of the deterioration, David's right, things have been ugly for most of the Obama term, but look, things have been ugly for 20 years. I remember on July 4th, 2003, Ted Kennedy went out and gave a speech saying Bush lied about WMD in Iraq. And within days, virtually every leader of the Democratic Party echoed it. And Kennedy knew it was a lie because he'd looked at the same intelligence and come to the same conclusion as Bush that Saddam had WMD, but he went and gave a speech in Georgetown and said, we shouldn't remove it by force, we should remove it by diplomacy. And yet for political reasons, because we were running out into a presidential election, he made this assault on the president's fundamental integrity. Now, it didn't keep Bush from working with him, because Bush sort of said, history will get it right, and it's more important for me as a leader, which is why in 2005, six and seven, Bush, McCain, and Kennedy worked very closely on immigration reform. But it was, to me, disturbing because it was like, for the purposes of political short-term gain, let's do something that we know from a guy who knew it and who had great enormous credibility in, 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 in leveling the charge. It, it, it really goes back further. I mean, if you want to really drill down into how, how this deterioration started, I, I would argue that it started uh, in the late 80s and early 90s uh, the, with the Gingrich Revolution. And Newt brought a much sharper edge politics to the House. And, you know, suddenly people like uh, Bob Michael uh, became, uh, you know, appeasers and, uh, and opponents became enemies. And that fed on itself. But I want to make a different point, which is, um, here, here's my, cons my real, con my, my most, uh, um, my, my deepest concern about democracy. Um, democracy and American democracy is built uh, to move slowly when the country is divided, as we are today. Uh, that is the way our system was set up, so that one side didn't overrun the other side and so on. Um, 
At the same time, there's enormous anxiety because we live in a time of warp speed change. Technology is bringing change at a faster and faster pace. That is wonderful for people who are well positioned to take advantage of it and very unsettling to the majority of people who, who are on the other side of that. And so you have this mismatch of change coming faster and faster and democracy stalled in many ways. And um, I worry about the dissonance that that creates as well. well let me, let can, me, can, can I make one point on this? All right. Yeah. I think David's right, and that's the, uh, that touches my optimistic nerve because we have been here before. We were, you know, if you think change is today, think about the change that was in the Gilded Age. Electrification of our cities, the, the creation of the gigantic urban uh, culture, a gigantic industrial society, and, 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 a, and, a, and it was one of the three periods in our recent, in our, our four periods in our past history where the percentage of immigrants as part of the U.S. population grew to 15%, which is where we are today. And yet along came a mild-mannered guy from Ohio, a reform-minded Republican named William McKinley, and changed American politics for the next 30 years. And if you look at it, when in American politics, when we run into these moments of, 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 of where, this, where we appear to be coming apart, what generally happens is there's somebody who comes along and calms the tempers and calms the waters. Unfortunately, he generally occupies what is now a funny-shaped office in the southeast corner of the West Wing. The, 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 and, thing, the, thing, the thing about that is uh, there's no doubt that we are living now in, in a kind of new gilded, new industrial, uh, post-industrial age, and some of the same tensions that you wrote. Car you usually plug your book here, so I'm going to do it for you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you <laughs> Carl wrote a great book about this era. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Trust, trust, but verify. Let's see yeah. how good you are. <laughs> and I highly recommend it. Um, uh, but um, uh, one of the things that happened was that government did intervene to, you know, to protect uh, child labor, children from, and, and in, invoke child labor laws, you know, mi minimum wage. We, um, you know, there were a range of things that were done. We made public education universal through high school, uh, prepared people to uh, compete. And there were a lot of things that, that government was able to do to ameliorate the impacts of all that change. I worry now because we've gone through a 40-year period in which uh, the brand of government has been so degraded that we don't have the tools to, uh, to, to kind of intervene in that way. Part of what these young people are saying is we should that they see this massive change and all of the dislocation that it creates and they feel like government should do something big to, uh, to, to, to deal with that. And so that's the, part of the source of their, uh, of their frustration. Well, let me ask you, because we've got two people who know not only the White House and the campaign so well, but you've been there when, history, when presidents have had to make leadership decisions and when Congress has had to either get on board or, or find, find a way to lead as well. Let me start with Carl. You and I were together on uh, Air Force One on that quiet September morning in 2001. And President Bush had been in office about nine months. He had been a governor, most of the presidents I've covered had been governors, they had executive experience, and he had worked with the Democratic legislature. How did George Bush, throughout the arc of his presidency, uh, use or change his leadership skills or find different ways to use leadership because he went from the post 9-11 uh, uh, crisis mode into, you know, uh, the Iraq uh, and weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. and Patriot Act, which which uh, took away so much of the, the kind of cooperation he got at the very beginning. Well, for, first of all, um, he applied what he what he what he had developed uh, his skills that he developed. I mean, you remember the first guy that when he gets elected, the first member of the House he calls is George Miller, the ranking Democrat on. House Education Labor. The first member of the Senate that he talks to is Ted Kennedy because he wants to get both of them behind his education initiative. But he, he had this mindset that his job as president was not to worry first and foremost about his party or even his presidency, but to worry about the country. 
I'll give you one 9-11 example that, would, that represents, I think, his continuing view of this. You, I don't know if you went after 9-11 when you went to Chicago with us. We had United in America, and we're right. going to go back up in the area. We, we had this terrible period where there was no air travel, and you know, we, we, we met in Chicago, and United and American were going to launch, com relaunch commercial traffic. And it was a deeply emotional event because everybody in that crowd knew somebody who'd been on one of those three planes. Lots of tears and so forth. Bush heard that Gephardt was going to be in Chicago, Democrat leader in the House. So he, brought Gep he asked Gephardt to return to Washington with him on Air Force One. And on Air Force One, he says to Dick, we've got a problem with our economy. We've, we're shedding a million jobs in 90 days. And we've got to stimulate our economy. And my economic people tell me, here are some things that we're going to offer to the Congress as a package. And number one on it was a cut in the corporate tax rate. Because they said, this will be easily priced in by companies. It'll be, they'll know what it does to their bottom line. And we'll reinvigorate investment. And there were three other items. And Gephardt said, Mr. President, I can go for those three others, but we can't, I can't get votes for cutting the corporate tax rate. I want you to do accelerated expensing and depreciation. And, and I think some Democrats will vote for that. So we got back to the White House. Bush calls Larry Lindsey, says, we're going to swap this out. And Larry protests because he says, that's the biggest economic bang we've got. And President says, Dick Gephardt has asked us to, we're going to do it. So the vote came, and we passed it, and Gephardt voted against it. And I'm a little pissed off, <laughs> which is a scientific. Yeah, let go, Carl. That yeah. was a long time ago. Yeah, that's a scientific. Yeah, it's hard, man. It's really hard. I, <laughs> I meet with my therapist all the time about it. <laughs> Who uh, would want that job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> buddy, buddy, at three hundred dollars an hour, a lot of people. <laughs> David, in uh, your but, in but let, let, let oh, me finish. Okay. So I walk in and I said to, I was rudely interrupted. <laughs> Carl's I'll take this up with my therapist next yeah. week. <laughs> working on that anger management yeah, exactly. thing. Exactly. So I walk into the Oval Office, and, I, and Bush says, how was the vote? And I said, blah, blah, blah. And Gephardt voted against it. And I was a little pissed off about it. And Bush laughed. And he said, did you think he was ever, why are you were so naive as to think he was ever going to vote for it? And I said, yeah, I was. <laughs> he told you what, what he wanted and told him, told him it would be acceptable, and then he voted against it. He said he was never going to go vote for it. But he says he knows that we listen to him. And that's what's important for a president in a moment like this to do. And that's why when Ted Kennedy goes out there and calls him a liar, and continues to call him a liar after the Silberman Robb Commission concludes that that's not accurate, Bush was still willing to say, you know what, I'm an adult. I'm going to be the adult in the room, and let's get Ted over here and see if we can't come to an agreement about comprehensive immigration reform. And Ted Kennedy, to his credit, made enormous, I mean, he came across. The cat, his, his brother had started family unification in 1963. And it was Ted Kennedy who said to the Catholic Church, I know you liked what my brother did, but we have to dial it back. It shouldn't be your uncle and your distant cousin. And if your parents come over here, you're financially responsible for them. But we need to do this in order to instill greater confidence in our immigration system. And that's the result of, of being an adult in the, in the Oval Office. So what did Bush do? He kept trying to do his best and let history be the judge. And as he used to say, history will get it right and we'll both be dead. Who cares? <laughs> David, let me ask you specifically about the Obama administration when uh, many presidents I've covered, when they are elected office, are, often have one, if not both, houses of Congress uh, come that way or, or keep, keep a majority. And it doesn't last in modern times. And President Obama had, uh, uh, had two years to get Obamacare done. And then he lost the House. And it made his leadership, uh, how did it make his leadership and his issues and his way of leading with Congress different after those first two years? Well, well first of all, let me just riff off of what Carl said. Let me say, parenthetically, um, I disagree with a lot of what President Bush did. I, I supported some really? of what he did. Really? That's a surprise but, to me. But I never, ever, I never questioned that he was doing what he thought was best for the country. And, um, and, in, and I've said this with, to Carl privately and, pu and in public before. Uh, when, we, uh, when we became, uh, when we were elected and there was a transition, no one was more su supportive than President Bush in every way he could, 
could, and including having all our counterparts meet with us, explain how the White House worked, what they did. He hosted a luncheon for President Obama and all the former presidents. Um, and I, you, I viewed that as an act of patriotism because he understood that even though they had deep disagreements, that they were trustees of this democracy and that required certain things uh, of them. And he I, authorized some security clearances for people working on the transition? He did, he did everything possible uh, to, be, uh, to be helpful to us. That said, and this doesn't involve President Bush, I mean, they had had a chance to work together a little bit uh, and they worked together when, uh, when Lehman Brothers collapsed, and I'll never forget President Obama, then Senator Obama, were in the campaign. It's uh, a tense time in the campaign, then the lead had narrowed. We were having a strategy meeting, it was a Sunday, and he said, I, uh, I spoke to Hank Paulson last night, and he told me about something that's gonna happen tonight that's gonna have really profound impact on the economy. And he said, I can't tell you what it is, but I told Hank that we would, to the best that we possibly could, given all the constraints of the campaign, we'd try and be as helpful as possible. And um, uh, we uh, ultimately, as people remember, a, few, a week or so later, maybe 10 days later, he was called to the White House for a big meeting. Right. John McCain asked for the meeting. Uh, McCain is running. McCain is running. He's our opponent. So you get the two right. presidential candidates. He, he, he gets it wasn't really what we wanted to do. We were prepping for a debate. McCain called Obama and said, you know, I think we should go and help solve this problem. And Obama, I think, said rightly, John, you think two presidential candidates tromping around Washington is likely to help solve this problem? <laughs> uh, but, he, uh, but then President Bush called and said, McCain really wants this meeting. We ha I'd like you to come. Obama came. At that meeting, John Boehner announced that the Republicans in the House would not support the TARP. And it was falling apart. And uh, President Bush said very little in the meeting. President Obama said, well, I guess we can start all over and Chairman Frank can start new. And, and then President Bush said, we're not starting over. And, uh, and, it, and President Obama and the House leadership provided the votes to help pass the TARP. And uh, that was as, the, as it should be. That was, it was a tough vote, it wasn't a popular vote, but it was essential. Um, and, but what was unsettling was three months later, we now are there, the, the economy is in full free fall, we're engaged in two wars at the same time, uh, and we anticipated that um, we could get uh, some level of cooperation around solving some of these problems, including implementing the TARP, mm -hmm. and we did not. Um, and uh, that, was a, that was deeply disappointing. Can, can I add a little insight on that? Yes. Because I ended up having dinner at, at, at an undisclosed location in Washington, D.C., a Korean restaurant, <laughs> in October of 2001 with Larry Summers. Uh, we have a mutual friend, Ben Stein. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller. And I won't bore you with the details, but we ended up having dinner. And during the course of the dinner, Summer says to me, you know, I'm really surprised that we didn't get more Republican support. I think 11 Republicans voted for the, for the stimulus bill. He says, I, I was really surprised we didn't get more support. Can you explain why? And I, I sort of knew the answers to the questions I was going to ask him in return. I said, well, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, were you there in the cabinet room when the president said we won, cut off Eric Cantor, was about ready to present his ideas? He said, yeah. And I said, well, did you see a problem with that? He said, no. I, I said, did you ever go up to Capitol Hill and meet with the Republicans and say, what do you guys got in the way of ideas? He said, oh, no. I said, you, you saw what their ideas were because they were in the newspaper. Did you ever contemplate swapping out anything in your package for what they, for what they were offering? He said, oh, no, we had the best ideas. I said, well, why should you be surprised if they didn't vote for it if you never gave them a sheet at the table? You need, in this system, you need to give people, you know, a, a, an ability to say yes. And, you know, I, I, President Obama did, did what he thought was the right thing and got it through, and he had the numbers to do it, obviously. But sometimes you need to have a Dick Gephardt moment. Does, yeah, I would say that package that uh, that recovered. I wasn't at the restaurant, though. I love Korean food and wish I had been invited. Uh, I, so I can't. I, I can't. I, don't I, like I can't Korean vouch food. for the the full yeah. account. Yeah. 
But, um, but uh, one of the reasons why the, tax, the uh, recovery, we, we, we were criticized by Democrats because there were uh, a third of the package or more were tax cuts, and part of the reason they were was because Republicans were asking for tax cuts. So, anyway. We've been talking about the, what had happened. I want now to move to explore why, and then we're going to be taking some questions from uh, Hawaii. Uh, why, have, why has this current era, uh, the last couple of years, been so traumatic? I have a theory, and I think it's the media. Now, I spent 41 years, proud years, covering the arc of, uh, over an arc of 41 years, the White House and presidential campaigns. But I do blame the digital age for the changing the way Americans get their news. And you look back to 1980, very close election, landslide, Reagan unseats a Democratic uh, president. What happened that year? CNN was born. 20 years later, the closest uh, election, from a landslide to the closest election in 2000, and what had happened by then? Lots of cable networks, lots of internet, and the, uh, the world, the way the media brought politics and decision making and presented leadership to the country was completely, completely different. David, uh, let me start with you. Where, what, what is the main factor that is happening to us now that might be able to be corrected or changed or rechanneled? Uh, well, there are some reforms that we could make, which I'll get to in a second, on your media point. I think what is absolutely true is that we now live in a world where we can create our own virtual reality silo in which uh, all uh, our views are affirmed and often not informed, and everyone outside that silo is alien and maybe even an enemy. Uh, and that has been a, a dramatically negative, uh, that has had a, dra a dramatically negative impact on our politics. And, um, you know, you have a competitive news media environment, uh, people fighting for eyeballs, and some have made an ideological pitch. You know, Fox uh, News, uh, the, Roger Ailes had an inspiration, which was there was an audience out there, and Fox News has become, and Carl's, uh, one of their assets, one of their great assets, but has become a. Uh, um, I, I think I said it was assets. just insulting. Assets. But I, yeah. I, said, yeah. yeah. Uh, I noticed. I, I know what you put the accent on, my friend. <laughs> Did not go. But uh, but but it has. I got more it, viewers than you do, pal. <laughs> I don't doubt it. It was. Uh, but they have done a remarkable job of consolidating um, Republicans under their. Uh, banner, uh, but social media obviously has been a huge factor in this. So media is part of it. Part of it is the, I, you know, and I was, a, I remember coming to Chicago in the early 70s, shortly after the Democratic Convention of 68, and like a lot of young liberals of that time, I was very much about reform. I wanted to, um, I wanted to see the democratization of the nominating process, wanted to take it away from the party bosses, and and, and, and that was done. And little by little, we basically have reduced the role of parties, which played a moderating influence in the selection of leaders and gave leaders uh, uh, some insulation in terms of the decisions that they had to make. Um, the way we, I mean, the, the, the just huge infusion of money into politics, I think, has, has helped add to this. And, and then the issue of, how we choose our representatives. We, the, you know, we have refined the art of redistricting, another, uh, another uh, uh, gift of technology, to the point where you can cut the salami very, very thin and you know, choose the voters you want. Um, and so we have less, fewer competitive districts than we, we, uh, than we once had. And most politicians- And that's true on both sides. Both sides. And most politicians need only fear a primary, and so that has really empowered uh, the polls in, in both parties uh, to, uh, uh, to really be a dominant force. Um, so all of those things, I think, have contributed uh, to where we are right now. Donald Trump uh, is not the cause of this. 
He is a guy who has exploited it effectively, but he is not the cause of it. This has been in the making for a very long time. Carl, I go ahead. Yeah, well, I agree with David on the, on the weakening of the parties. I think that's really vital. I, I have a slight disagreement with Ann on your, your, the media. We've always had this. You know, we, 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 how big was television changing our elections and our media? How big was radio? How big was the creation of cheap daily newspapers? How much was the telegraph, which suddenly knit us together, it used to take weeks or months for information to flow from one side of the country? So in a way, we're going back to what, the way that we were in the early days of the Republic, where we all read our little local newspaper, and it was David's cocoon. We read our local Federalist paper, our local Republican paper, or our local Whig paper. So we're, we're back there. And I, I don't have an answer for it, but, I, but you're right. The media has a role to play in it. But we've dealt with it before, and we're going to have to deal with it again. I agree with David about parties. I would add wait, one wait, can I just interrupt you on, yeah, one, yeah. on that point? You're absolutely right about that. Uh, but the difference is that those newspapers had to be uh, printed, and there were long lag times before they arrived. Now things travel instantaneously, yeah. uh, you know, and the incendiary nature of that can be very, very profound. So, you know, again, I don't want to sound like a Luddite. I think there's so many great things that technology affords us. But I, I said to someone earlier, I, I fear that this technology is advancing faster than our ability to fully get our arms around its well, impact. Well, I, I agree, man, but it's happened before and we've somehow muddled our way through and my sense is we'll find a way to muddle through here, but there's a, we're ignoring a big thing, I think, two, two big things. One is, I think part of the problem is that both political parties have largely succeeded and they, their agendas have run out. The Republicans wanted to have, quote, limited government tax cuts and defeat the commies. Well, the commies are gone. Democrats wanted to democratize the country and, you know, institutionalize civil rights. And we've made great progress in that regard. But both political parties are like exhausted boxers. They're sort of running out of ideas. So there is something good to be seen in both parties, both conservatives and progressives and liberals, trying to figure out what ought to come next. But the other thing that we're not talking about is there was an, an aftermath of the fiscal crisis that is with us today. It created a moment of populism in America. Bush passes TARP, Obama implements it, and the, re and the response is to create populism on the right and left. Now, populism is not an, a, 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 a you know, very well-organized, orderly political ideology. It's more a sentiment. And on the left, it shares something in common. But right and left share something in common. Left sentiment says, left populism says, the relationship between the little man and his government has been destroyed because right now the, the rich and the powerful, the corporations and the wealthy are in control of things, and we have to redo the relationship between the little man and his government. You bailed out the bankers, and nobody went to jail, and you bailed them out with my money, and I suffered. And right populism says, the relationship between the little man and his government has been altered, because the little man is getting screwed by the wealthy, the powerful, and those with a loophole in the law and a lobbyist in, in Washington. The banks got bailed out and you bail them out with my money. And then you turned around and bailed out Solyndra. And so both this moment of populism, which is sort of eating away at the flanks of both parties, is saying we can't trust the government, we can't trust our political parties, we need upheaval in our political system. And we've had these moments before, but we have always found a way to deal with them. We have not yet found I, I think one them. important thing about that is uh, you, you're right about much of what you said, but it's also true All of that what I said, <laughs> man. All of what I said. In your own mind, you're right in all of what you said, but in reality, uh, there is a... Uh, there is a um, Which party smokes more dope, dope than the other party? I just want to ask that question. <laughs> this, um, uh, there was a... The, one of the realities of the financial crisis and the economic crisis was that um, uh, companies rationalized themselves, technology uh, was used uh, uh, to try and solve the problem of, 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 pro of productivity, and, and, um, and, and there, it's just demonstrable in the data that uh, there were large numbers of Americans who have been kind of, um, uh, you know, peddling just to try and keep their place um, as a result, they have not recovered. In the, the economy has recovered. These have been years of great growth, dating back, I'd point out, uh, to uh, 2011. Uh, and, and, and but 
but not everybody has recovered, and that creates a lot of tension as well, and an audience for that, That's my point. That's exactly my point. Oh, then you were right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and look, you know, now we're starting, it's like, you know, the last two years have been the, f the first two years in the recovery in which wages for working people rose faster than wages for supervisory personnel. And the reason, because of tight labor market. So, yeah, I get it. I mean, there was, there was a period where people, even after, even after, the, you know, and look, TARP was the right thing to do. Right to pass it, right to implement it. We actually made money on it. Yeah. But nobody, no, it was out, well there, out, there, out there between, in the middle of the country, people said, you know what? Either I'm a left winger and by God, you're screwing me, or I'm a right winger and you're screwing me, and we're dealing with that today. And we by the way, I mean, the, 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 the uh, there, it wasn't just, you know, the attitude of a lot of these folks was uh, bailouts for the, uh, for the wealthy, handouts for the poor, and I'm stuck in the middle. Right. I mean, that was sort of the, right. that was sort of more right. the, the right wing populist argument, right. but that was another right. argument. Right. Uh, one more question, a pair of questions before we start taking questions from the, uh, from the students and uh, the folks in Hawaii. Why do so few Americans actually get out and vote? And another question which had been passed along to me is, can a successful presidential campaign also be a principled campaign? Uh, number one, do, why, why doesn't America have a much, much higher voter participation rate? They don't want to encourage the bastards. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I, I'm serious. Yeah. I think a lot of people say, I'm so sick of politics. You know, there's, uh, there's, there's nothing in it for me. I'm not going to participate. But that doesn't leave you with much. Well, I know, but, but you know, look, uh, we, we, the good news is we're in a secular period in which presidential participation has been rising since 1996. Think about it. In 2004, a quarter more people vote than voted in 2000. And so it, may, it sort of may be, may be about ready to peak. I doubt it. I think we're going to have, you know, we're well, going to have a period w which is unusual in American history. 1996 to 2000, 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016. I bet you 2020 is even higher. So, we're, we're, you know, the problem sometimes solves itself by people saying there's something in this that causes me to feel I've got something to do to help my country. I, I think also I, we should note that the turnout in the midterm elections mm -hmm. were, was astronomically higher for, than yeah, four years term. earlier. And yeah. I suspect that the turnout in this presidential election will be higher. And whatever else you say uh, about Donald Trump, he, he, he certainly has inspired people to pay attention. And I, I think that he is responsible for uh, some, of that, uh, some of that increased turnout. If you, if you chart the midterm increase, it's like the presidential year, which except that the, 24, uh, the 2014 to 2018 goes like this. And I, I think David's right. We may see similarly, you know, that may presage an even bigger increase. In we have an unusual treat tonight. Uh, questions actually from two elected members of the Hawaii State Legislature. Let us uh, roll question number one. Hi, I'm Representative Scott Matayoshi, a Democratic member of the Hawaii State House of Representatives. My question is, when you're having a discussion with someone with fundamentally different viewpoints than your own, what are a few tips and tricks you use to keep that discussion civil and productive? Or do you keep it civil in production? So this gets back to that marijuana thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a Democrat, uh, you know. Um, there's there's a coffee group in Austin. Austin, incidentally, is a, you may not know this, but is a pretty liberal town, sort of like a little blueberry in a sea of red. Um, and there's this coffee group, and there are four guys in it, and they're all great writers, and they're all left of center, ranging from slightly left of center to way out there, and. I feel honored that they let me come to join their coffee group if I'm in town on Monday. And why? Because we can talk about things. And, you know, it's just, it's civility. It's, you know, look, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going to persuade them, maybe I'm not, but I'm not going to get angry about it. And they're not going to, they're going to have a chance to say what they want to say, and they're not going to get angry about it. And I don't know how to recreate that. I, I, you know, we, we, this may surprise you. 
you, you all think of Texas as some redneck right wing, you know, do you know we don't organize our legislature on a partisan basis? Did you know that? We have 20 Republican state senators. When I moved to Texas, there were two out of 31. We have 20 out of 31 now. Out of 150 members of the House, I, worked, I went to Texas and worked for the senior Republican in the Texas House. We had 13. They're now 88 or 90. And we don't organize it on a partisan basis. They're Democrat chairman of the House, Democrat chairman of the Senate. When I went to work for, in Texas, my, my, my member had been a chairman of a committee when we had 13. So outside of some big high-profile issues, redistricting and bathroom bill, we try and get, I mean, we try and get things done because we bring them together for 140 days every two years. Second most populous state in the union, 140 days every two years, and you got to go home and live under the laws you pass, and we're going to pay you $600 a month. And plus it works. Plus tips. Plus tips. <laughs> and, it, and, and it works. It works. Free this year, us. This year, the budget for our state passed the Senate unanimously and passed the Texas House 147 to 3. And why? Because the members had to get there. They had limited time. They had to get together. They had to find a way out of it. And... They, they all particularly learned from the last session when we had the bathroom bill up that, that, that time's wasted. And, but I don't know how to get that into our political discourse the, um, nationwide. I think we have to somehow find the humanity in each other again. I mean, Carl and I, uh, I do this podcast called The Axe Files. And uh, Carl and I, we were actually in Prague uh, at a conference and we sat down and we did this. And I started this thing. Kiev. Oh, it was in Kiev. Yes, Kiev. it was in Kiev. Uh, I started this thing uh, because um, I thought if you f sort of learned about who people were, even if you disagreed about issues, that you could find common things. We've, we, found a, we have a common tragic uh, thing, which is that we both had parents who committed suicide. And we spent a fair amount of time in that show talking about that, and we've done things together since uh, on suicide prevention. I don't agree with Carl on a lot of things, um, but I don't, uh, but, but I recognize him as, a, as a, a person, as a human being. We're friends. There are lots of things to talk about other than the things that we disagree about. Um, maybe, maybe President Trump has brought us closer together. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but I think that you know, part of what you were saying earlier, part of what happened was uh, legislators went, live at home now and not in Washington. And when people lived with each other and they went to the same church or synagogue or, or, or play, you know, the same little league team or school, uh, the kids went to schools, sure. they got to know each other. And so when they fought, Barack Obama, when he was in the state senate, had tremendous success. Uh, in part because the legislators would go to Springfield, small town, and they would live down there. And they would spend a lot of time together socially. He had a poker game every week where he took money from the Republicans. <laughs> and, um, uh, but we should he, have been warned. We he, should uh, have been warned. But he was, uh, but he, he was able to pass things like uh, uh, death penalty reform and racial profiling laws. and and uh, to help shape the welfare reform bill in Illinois and do it with large majorities, Republican and Democrat, because he, he knew these folks and he was able to negotiate in good faith. If you treat people like they are the enemy, if you call them, if you, if, if, because I disagree with Carl, I decide he's not as American as I am, it, it makes it a hell of a lot harder to come to some agreement. Well, and that, of course, the trend in Washington, as you say, has gone just the opposite. Members don't necessarily all live in Washington and keep their families here and their kids growing up together. I'm going to take question number two from the uh, Hawaii legislature, and actually, we found a Republican. Aloha. I'm Representative Val Okimoto, a Republican member of the Hawaii House of Representatives. I represent District 36, which covers Mililani Malka, Mililani Town, and Waipio Acres. As a newly elected representative and one of five Republican members of the Hawaii House of Representatives, it is a challenge to get elected in a blue state because of the effect of politics on the national level. 
My question is, what are the biggest obstacles to civil and logic-based discourse in this country, and what can we do to fix it? Well, and, and I like that where she says obstacles to civil and logic-based discourse. Yeah, how do you, how logic. Do you introduce, how do you introduce <laughs> that back into, uh, uh, into the uh, political mix? Uh, voters ought to reward people who are aspirational. The toughest thing in politics is to explain what you're for and what it is that you want to achieve. The easiest thing to do is trash your opponent. And we've gotten really good in politics at trashing your opponent. We're, it, it, but it, the thing that I see is, is candidates like, like President Obama. God, what an aspirational message. What an incredible message. I'm not, I don't want to be the president of red states, blue states, but the United States. And after a bitter period of division in the country over the war, it's exactly what people wanted to hear. And if you look back again, again, I recommend my own book, The Triumph of William McKinley. <laughs> For those of you who don't want dry political history, it's got sex, violence, backstabbing, betrayal, and really cool nicknames. But one of the reasons that McKinley wins this election, which he ought to have lost, is that he strikes these moments of national unity. For example, here is the decorated Union war veteran who invites 2,000 Confederate veterans of the campaigns. These were the men on the other side of the guns who were trying to kill him, and he becomes the first Republican presidential candidate ever to meet with Confederate veterans and ask for their vote. He's the first presidential candidate of either party to appear openly with black voters and ask for their vote, and he did so in the South in March of 1895 before he even became a candidate, and he did so openly. And this was unknown. You dealt with them, if you're if you a Democrat, you didn't deal with blacks at all. If you're a Republican, you dealt with them at a distance through intermediaries. And here's a man who shows up in Jacksonville, Florida, and then Savannah, Georgia, and appears before black audiences and explains that his view is we're all in this together. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I hope we have more politicians in both parties who are aspirational, who can sort of, accept the fact that they're not going to get everything they want and don't demand to get everything that they want and put more of an emphasis in their cam in the conduct of their campaigns on things that, that cause people to say, this is what they're for and I, I, they've drawn me to them because of it. But we have, to align, we have to align the incentives so that they actually get rewarded for that and not punished for that. And it goes back to, in part, what I mentioned before. If the loudest voices in our debate are the dominant voices in primary contests. Um, it makes it, uh, it does not reward fact-based, uh, you know, logic-based uh, logic uh, uh, candidates. And is there more of a burden on, in a place like the Hawaii legislature where the Democrats have the overwhelming majority, is it the burden on them to make sure that the Republicans are at least at the table and have a voice and are, and are heard? I would think so, yeah, I would think so. And I would think that there's probably an incentive. You know, what I heard in that question was she was not a Washington-style politician and out of necessity, you know, tries to work across uh, those lines and, um, and hopefully people reach back. Yeah. This may be parochial, but we had uh, last year in the Texas Republican primaries a bunch of contests between sort of what you would suggest, the you know, sort of the hard asses inside the Republican primary, and then people who had a broader view of things. And what was interesting to me was that there was a concerted effort to go in and aid the people who were the more, let's say, aspirational candidates. And the Republicans succeeded in every single contest except one. And and, and, and that one contest, the, the candidate of the of the hard right put in $2 million of his own money into a Republican primary for a state house seat. Seemed to have an impact. But in the rest of them, because community and business leaders said, we want somebody who's gonna put education, not the bathroom bill, focus on jobs and not some esoteric social issue, because we want somebody who's gonna recognize they're going to Austin and they're gonna be working in a bipartisan environment, not somebody who is a hard partisan. One of the issues was, should we continue this great Texas tradition of organizing the legislature on merit, not party. And in every one of those contests except one, well, I shouldn't say that, in all but three, the good guys prevailed, and the two races they won in the primary, they lost in the general election. And in all the rest of them, the good guys 
held a seat in the fall. And so, it should be noted that in the uh, in the uh, congressional races last year, you had 31 Democrats win in districts that President Trump carried. Right. And by and large, they were candidates like that. I mean, they fit that bill. They don't get a lot of attention because the nature of being moderate is you don't draw a lot of attention to yourself. But uh, that was that is the story of 2018, where those 31. Yeah. Um, Back to your point, though, about the media. There's I've read a rough draft of a column that's going to be in the Wall Street Journal later this week. It's brilliant. Carl writes a great column in the Wall Street Journal. I, <laughs> I forgot to forgot every, to every mention every Thursday that. morning. But I'm going to make a fortune here. Yeah, you are, man. I owe it to you. But one of the interesting things to me is is that the media do not hold some of these fringe members responsible for what they say and do. With all due respect to AOC, that draft resolution that she put out on the Green New Deal, where it talks about you know cow flatulence and unspecified actions to crimp commercial uh, air passenger travel, was weird, and and and. <laughs> And earlier, on July 5th, in an interview on, on the New Yorker radio program, she said, I want to abolish DHS. It was an egregious mistake. Really? No, no, everybody can get on the airplanes with box cutters? <laughs> and, and yet, immediately what she did is she said, when, when, when I went on television and attacked her, she immediately tweeted out, well, talking about reorganizing is responsible. Well, you didn't say reorganize. You said abolish it. And yet the media sort of treats her as sort of, you know, be a serious legislator. Go write the goddamn bill if you, want to, if you want to abolish it. Go write the bill if you want to reorganize, but be precise in your language. And the media do not hold some of these people on the fringes of both parties responsible for their nutty ideas. It's just part of the drama. Well, she wouldn't be the first to have uh, suggested that, they, that that department be re reorganized. And, no, but uh, she'd be the, among the first to say it should be abolished. Yes, I know. But, the, the question is, and maybe the reporters didn't write it that way because they understood that she wasn't talking about abolishing oh, no, the no, functions. No. I, wait, I quote her extensively. I'll let you make that own judgment on I will. Thursday mornings Let's, when you pick up the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> let us all meet here on Thursday afternoon and continue this discussion. I have another question that this one I am going to read to you. It is from Colin Moore, director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. To what extent has the rise of the political consulting industry contributed to political polarization in America? And do you expect it, the role in politics to change? And then he says, in the near future. <laughs> hey, I got to run. You want to take this? Yeah. <laughs> well, the consultants have, already been, have always been with us. The problem, though, is again back to what David, the point, David's point: the parties have been weakened. It used to be that the that the consultants, the, the 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 chief organizer, the chief consultant to the Republican combine, the bad guys during the Gilded Age, the Republican bosses was James S. Rhett Clarkson, publisher of the Des Moines Register, and he was their chief operative. And so we've always had consultants around, but now as you weaken parties, you strengthen the role of consultants and independent actors in campaigns. They're not responsible for, you know, going in and saying to the party chairman, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, pal. Instead, it's like, you know, how can I throw a firebomb or, you know, pull the pin on the grenade and, and cause something bad to happen for you and a good thing for happen for me in a, in a primary contest? Yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm for anything that we can do to... Re I, look, I, I help organize a super PAC. American Crossroads, we raised $195 million in the last election cycle. And all you gave me was a lousy 20? Yeah. <laughs> well, I do it as a volunteer because I don't want to take a single dime under the table or over the table from it. But I wish to God we didn't have to do it. I would rather that money flow through a political party because, as David said, political parties have tended to be vehicles that have tended, mostly, not always, to sort of keep things sort of towards the, towards the center of American politics. They're practical people, they want to win. So it's not like who can, who's got the best grenade throwing ability, it's who can put together the votes to win. And, but, but we've weakened the ability of parties to act on behalf of candidates, and uh, as a result, the consulting class has risen. But they've always been, you know, they've even made themselves office holders. Martin Van Vuren became vice president because he carefully constructed the tariff of 1820, uh, eight to, uh, to help elect Andrew Jackson, President of the United States, and Jackson knew it, 
and said, that boy did a good job for me. He's, he's made it possible for me to, be, to, to have win Pennsylvania and New York and to diminish the, the, the Whig strength in the, in the Northeast. P put that guy on the ticket, smart guy. Yeah. But, you know, the, particularly, I'm, I'm, I'm on a tear for, about the consulting class in some parts of the country because it, it's just all about Yeah, the that's Benjamin. the issue. I mean, there's more money than there's ever been in the system. And, the, uh, and so there's, again, it's a question of incentives. The incentive is there to try and grab some of that cash. And there, there is a, a kind of unbridled nature to it. And there's no, there are no kind of guardrails or norms. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to get to two more questions before we get the hook here. And this one is from Denise Conan, Dean of the University of Hawaii at Manoa College of Social Science. And Denise asks, has the popularity of social media polarized politics, you think, and led to the downfall of civility in everyday discourse? We're not, not just, but in the way we treat our neighbors and our families and our community. I worry about the corrosive effect of, of Twitter and others. I don't read my Twitter account. I send things out, but I don't read it because the first time I read it, I had hair and it wasn't gray. And, uh, you know, people are ugly. And I, it says something to me about a society in which you get rewarded by attention for being rude and, bra and, and crude and angry and over the top. And that seems to me to be a lot of what social media is. It also is misleading. I think uh, to, if there are any journalists around here, and I'm speaking to one here, um, you can, one of the things that's happened to, to campaign coverage is way too much attention is paid to Twitter, and you know, there was an interesting survey that showed that uh, Democrats who are frequent users of Twitter uh, uh, were supportive of the abolition of ICE, and, but they weren't the largest part of Democrats, and overwhelmingly, the, the other co cohort of Democrats had exactly the opposite uh, view. So um, I think one of the things that's happened to political coverage is we cover Twitter, we cover polls, we don't cover people enough. Not nearly enough. This question comes from a student in Hawaii, Megan O'Connor. Do, <clears throat> do you think President Trump emboldens or undercuts traditional Republican values? And she adds, does anyone care anymore? Um, first, before I answer that question, uh, let me say something about uh, Hawaii. I just got back. Uh, from Hawaii, and my wife and I flew out of Honolulu. And I don't know if you've gone to the Honolulu airport, but there's this unbelievable exhibit about Senator Inouye. And it's got a picture, it's got his Congressional Medal of Honor, it's got pictures of him, it's got his life story. And it is deeply moving that a man who was so mistreated by his country loved it so deeply that he would make such sacrifices. And it really is a great testimony to the man, and more importantly, to our country even though the state only has five Republicans out of 51 in the state house. <laughs> but uh, I think this is a big question because I think a lot of Republicans say to themselves, I like what he's doing, but I don't like how he's doing it. And the, the, our parties are so broken that, um, that right now, you know, if you attack on either party, if you attack a leader, of, if the leader of the party is attacked, everybody rallies around. And um, whether this is going to be the big, th the big thing facing the Republican Party is in the future is what is it going to be? Tr there is, you know, Trump is trying to sort of have an ideology, but his most successful parts have been following sort of traditional Republican dogma, tax cuts, conservative judges, uh, deregulation, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, all in energy program, all in energy policy. So the real question is going to be what comes after Trump. And what's also going to be true is what comes after whoever the Democrat nominee is. Because, as I said earlier, I think both parties are exhausted. There are these two boxers. They're in the ring. They've been beating each other up. They can barely stumble around. And that's why we're seeing the battle uh, inside the Democratic Party with the, this hard left, the idea of, you know, Medicare for all, you know, everybody on the stage, you know, who's in favor of, of free health care for illegal immigrants? Let's all raise our hands. I mean... You know, this is, this is going on in both parties. It ain't going to be pretty, but how it's going to be resolved is going to determine maybe the next 
the, the general tone of the next 20 or 30 years of American politics. You know, I will say, um, if uh, a Democratic president, uh, we, we just, we're, we're headed for a record, uh, record deficits. Um, we, we are involved in a trade war. If a Democratic president had done those things, there are a lot of Republicans, I expect Karl Rowe would be one of them, who would be pretty hard on them. Um, and, uh, but this is Donald Trump's Republican Party now, and I think there's a great deal of you know, reticence, and we've seen it in the last couple of days, uh, to tangle with him because he will come back and he will take you out, and we saw it with a number of members of Congress. And uh, so, uh, you know, this is, his agenda has, some of the old Republican agenda is part of his agenda, and, and his agenda has superseded some of the old Republican agenda, but make no mistake about it, it's his party right now. He, he's really done an amazing thing. He's turned Republicans into protectionists and Democrats into ardent foes of Russia. And I mean, it was hard to, you know, hard to, hard to see. My, my, my closing question to you is looking forward. Um, if, Carl, you say the parties are in a state of exhaustion, um, David, you have, uh, you have looked across the landscape and, and worry about the, uh, uh, about the future of it as well. What is it the American voters should demand of the candidates and the parties and possibly a, a, a move away from a two-party system? Is a third party ever going to... Uh, uh, ever going to have a major impact in this country, Carl? You're shaking your head. Low. Yeah, no. Uh, we are, are the electoral college and state uh, web of state laws are going to make us a two-party system. But look, here's where my optimism. I, 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 I admit that I'm less optimistic than I was six or seven years ago. But there is a fundamental optimism, and that is, there comes a moment where the good common sense in the American people reasserts itself, and it happens periodically. And along comes somebody who is worthy of that support, and things change. And um, it happened, you know, we, were, we seemed a country lost in the late 1970s. We'd gone through a terrible period of urban unrest and violence on campuses and deep divisions over the war in Vietnam. And we seemed like we'd lost our mojo. We were a country of malaise. And along came a B actor from California and restored our confidence. You know, we, we were in the midst of a deep and dark depression. Voices of populism were rising up. Huey Long, Father Coughlin, and along came the, the man uh, crippled by polio who said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Along comes my man McKinley. You think politics today is ugly? I'm reading the dry debate in 1884 on a trade measure, and one, one Democrat from, uh, from Georgia says of another member of Congress, I would not blank you if you were a dog. Four letters, you can fill it in. And he, who he was attacking was the former Democratic Speaker of the House, Randall of Pennsylvania. And I mean, we had 20 years where nobody got 50% of the vote in a presidential election. Two years of Republican government, House, Senate, presidency, two years of Democratic government, and the rest of those 20 years, of 24 years, the other 20 years, were, were divided government in which little got done because they not only were deeply divided and, and, and at each other's throats over their party ideologies, but they're still fighting the Civil War. When the Democrats take control of the House in 1874 for the first time in 16 years, it's called the victory of the brigadiers because so many former Confederate officers got elected. And they got elected by systematically wiping out the black Republican vote in the South by violence that is hard for us to comprehend today. So has it been bad before? Yeah. But at some point, the American people say, enough. And this person represents our aspirational goals for a better country, a better future, better community, better nation, and it happens. You know, I, I agree with all that. I, as I said earlier, I think there is a self-correcting nature to our democracy. Um, and the fact that more people are paying attention and participating, I think, is an encouraging uh, sign. I think there are obstacles that exist today that are, um, that are significant that we didn't face in the past. We faced them in a more primitive form. And so we're going to have to work to, you know, that in terms of how we communicate and so on. But I'll tell you what, if you ask me what makes me optimistic, I work every day at this Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. And I uh, come into contact with uh, young people who are um, skeptical 
about where we are, skeptical about, uh, about government, um, but totally committed to trying to make their contribution in the world. And um, they're, they're um, more open to each other. They're, uh, you know, in, in my view, more tolerant. Um, and, uh, and, and I have great hope for this next generation. Uh, one of the reasons I do the job I do is because I want to go home hopeful every day. And they do it for me. Uh, and many of them are now w working here and elsewhere uh, doing things that are actually making a difference and changing lives and uh, uh, pointing us in the right direction. So uh, I, uh, my, my hope is invested in them. And this country is in the hands of the American people and those in, coming along in the future in the, exactly the kind of ideals that the Inoue Foundation uh, has promoted during this series of uh, five remarkable years of lectures. Please thank our extraordinary panel, David Axelrod, Carl Rowe, gentlemen, thank you. You know, over five years of these uh, in this series, Ann Compton has dealt with cabinet secretaries, corporate CEOs, uh, former cabinet secretaries, journalists, and now political consultants, and every time has brought it home. Special thanks to Ann for five years. And thank you all for spending your evening here with us at the Library of Congress.